Hi, I'm Tracy Kimball. And I'm Tom Kimball. Welcome to MS Learn Online. Complementary and alternative medicine includes a variety of interventions from dietary supplements to relaxation techniques, exercise, and acupuncture. In this first program of a two-part series, we'll hear from Dr. Alan Bowling, a neurologist who has been studying conventional and unconventional medicine for years. He spoke with correspondent Rick Summers about the many different options that are available for people with MS. So uh, complementary means that the unconventional medicine is used alongside conventional medicine, and that's actually what most Americans do. And a very small percent, you know, maybe five to eight percent of Americans use unconventional medicine instead of a conventional medicine, and that's alternative use. Okay, so we're talking about complementary and alternative medicine alternatives. And for the sake of the discussion, we wanted to group this into four categories and kind of pick through them one at a time. One being diet, two being vitamins, minerals, and herbs, three physical medicine, and the fourth, which is generically called other, which we'll talk about. First, let's talk about diet and the importance of really what we're putting into our bodies. Yeah, I think the whole area of diet, if you uh, look in the MS literature on the internet or lay books or professional books, it's really confusing. There are all kinds of uh, contradictory viewpoints out there. And I think often it gets polarized. People want it to be all good with diet or totally negative with diet. The evidence, as I see it, is somewhere in between the two of those. So uh, the basic uh, concept with uh, the most commonly considered dietary approach is that it may be helpful for people with MS to decrease their overall intake of saturated fats, things that are common in uh, dairy products, uh, lard has uh, saturated fats, uh, so to cut back the amount of those and then increase the amount of polyunsaturated fats which include omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Uh, the omega-3 fatty acids are probably the ones that are lowest in most Americans' diet and that omega-3 fatty acids typically are in the form of fish oils. So to kind of accentuate that intake, which can be through uh, increased fish intake itself, or possibly consideration of supplements, but that should be discussed with a healthcare provider. I had a doctor, a neurologist once that said, eat whatever you want, and I was very uncomfortable with that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important that we make good food choices. Mm -hmm. I would agree with you, and my uh, my general approach to MS, uh, which has gotten me interested in this area and makes me interested in diet and other unconventional approaches, is if you have MS, since we don't have a cure, why not just kind of get all the good chips you can on your side, and one of those chips can be the diet chip. And it's not absolutely proven, but there's no evidence it's harmful, and there's some evidence it could be helpful, so why not get the diet chip on your side along with other chips which could be medications and some of the other approaches we talk I about. I often say that even if it's not going to help your MS, it's going to help you in, you know, in other senses exactly. of the way. Uh, how about vitamins and supplements and herbs? Yeah, and that's kind of a blend. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of uh, goes into the diet area as well. As I was mentioning, if you're going to increase your polyunsaturated fatty acid intake, if you're going to increase omega-3 fatty acid intake, that can then lead to considering maybe whether taking something like a fish oil product. Uh, so certainly fish oil, that's something that people with MS might want to consider. Another very hot topic is vitamin D. And you know, there have been two assumptions about vitamin D for years that we found out are not true. So one assumption is that most Americans have enough vitamin D because we fortify our foods. That's very clearly not true. Multiple studies show that Many American adults, 50% or more, have uh, low vitamin D levels. Well, name a food for me that would include vitamin D. Vitamin That's a challenge, and that may be part of the issue. Okay. So uh, salmon, uh, fatty fish, typically mm -hmm. has the highest amounts of vitamin D. Okay. But we fortify our foods at a level that's probably too low to account for the low levels that people have at this point. So vitamin D, one assumption was that we all, we thought most people had adequate levels. And then the other is we thought vitamin D just helped regulate bone metabolism. Mm -hmm. And it's been shown very clearly vitamin D has effects in many different tissues in the body, including helping regulate the immune system. So the concern is if people with MS have low vitamin D, then that could lead to further 
dysfunction of the immune system, it could possibly lead to worsening of the disease. You start taking vitamin D, will you notice a difference in your day-to-day? -day? I mean, do you feel any this, difference? Uh, this whole story is evolving, so we don't have the exact uh, okay. answer to questions like that. And that's, this is definitely something that needs to be talked about with a health care provider. And this vitamin D area is quite tricky now because some people have totally adequate vitamin D levels. So they don't need any, mm -hmm. and other people are severely deficient and they need quite a bit to correct the deficiency that they have. So those are two supplement approaches, and then, uh, so that's fish oil and vitamin D, mm -hmm. and then on the herbal side, cranberry may be helpful for preventing urinary tract infections, right. valerian might be helpful for insomnia, St. John's wort for mild to moderate uh, depression. depression. So yeah. those are some other uh, those, so those are things on the herbal side that may be helpful for some MS related. But again, and I think we really want to emphasize that you shouldn't just take it upon yourself to, to, to jump into the pool. Without. Exactly. And I think especially with these uh, dietary supplements because they're chemicals just like drugs are chemicals and they can produce good therapeutic effects in the body but they can potentially have toxic effects. They can also potentially interact with other medications. So. A complex question, even though it's a supplement that you can just go to the grocery store and buy it off the shelf, it still is altering the chemistry of your body. Let's talk about medicine and, and physical things that you can do, and Tai Chi I'm not overly familiar with, but these are all areas that, that basically uh, you dabble in. Right, right. So on the, in terms of physical methods or uh, body-based uh, methods that are on the unconventional side, Two that have been studied somewhat in MS are yoga and Tai Chi. I think most people are familiar with those. You know, they involve stretching the muscles in pretty uh, extreme positions. Uh, they involve a lot of balance, include strengthening of the muscles. So that happens with yoga as well as uh, Tai Chi. In terms of formal studies, actually a very high quality study that looked at yoga in people with MS and found that yoga as well as conventional exercise was helpful for preventing MS-related fatigue. With Tai Chi, a couple of lower quality studies, but they indicated some improvement with muscle uh, stiffness or spasticity and also with uh, walking uh, steadiness. I think it's interesting when you think about yoga and Tai Chi, I think certainly if you have ever tried one of those or if you just know, can imagine in your head pictures of people doing those, it's quite interesting that they involve controlling the muscles, producing muscle uh, movement. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of signals going from the brain out to the muscle group, and that's kind of what we typically think of it as exercise. That's what we often do with Western-based exercise. But those extreme postures with Tai Chi and yoga also involve sensation signals that come from often the feet and then go all the way up to the brain. So their signals kind of going down to the muscle and also signals kind of coming back up. And that's something that's different with those uh, sort of unconventional exercise methods relative to some Western-based exercise. And it may be a way to sort of condition or exercise the sensation part of the nervous system that we often don't get with Western-based exercise. Yoga, Tai Chi, are there others? Those are the two that are um, uh, most common, that have been most studied. Pilates is certainly something that's uh, popular, kind of very good at uh, uh, strengthening the core muscles, and that may be very helpful for people with MS. Often the core muscles get uh, weakened, but there haven't been any uh, formal studies of that. <clears throat> A very uh, infrequently thought of therapy, uh, but certainly is something happens quite often in Colorado is uh, uh, hippotherapy or horse therapeutic horseback riding. So there actually have been studies in uh, children with cerebral palsy and then limited studies in people with MS. Not perfect studies by any means, but studies suggesting it could help with walking stability, might help with muscle stiffness, could help with bowel and bladder function. Talk to me about acupuncture. Yeah, acupuncture is uh, a component of what's called traditional Chinese medicine. So there's acupuncture, Chinese herbs, relaxation met methods, including meditation. It's actually quite a holistic approach and maybe has uh, a better holistic approach, does have a better holistic approach than uh, conventional Western medicine, I think. Uh, for the acupuncture piece, has not been well studied in uh, MS, but in other conditions, looks like it might be helpful for pain. 
could also potentially be helpful for some other MS symptoms like anxiety or depression, but has not been well studied there. Uh, I generally think of acupuncture as something that's quite low risk and may be helpful for one or more MS symptoms, but I think it's very important for people with MS to keep in mind that often at an acupuncture treatment session, at the end of the session, they'd be given a bag of herbs to take uh, after the acupuncture. And I think of those herbs as kind of the opposite, in my mind, as the acupuncture itself. So the herbs, those are chemicals that can potentially affect the immune system, might uh, antagonize the effect of MS medications. The, those herbs have never been shown to have a beneficial effect on the disease process of MS or the symptoms of MS. So I th acupuncture is low risk, possibly helpful. The herbs, no known evidence for benefit and some significant theoretical risks with those. Obviously, if you're going to choose an acupuncturist, that you should choose somebody who's familiar with MS. Uh, right, if you can, and there are uh, national listings of uh, trained, certified uh, acupuncturists. Uh, we had mentioned at the top uh, talking about other, and right. it's a category all to its own, and talking about aromatherapy, um, different relaxation techniques. Uh, I have friends that have said to me, yeah, you should put magnets in your shoes. I mean, everybody seems to come out of the woodwork right. when they have you know, their own method of how we're going to mm -hmm. solve the MS problem. Tell me about some of those. Yeah, I think the, that other category is uh, it's full of lots of different therapies that often are not thought about. And just to kind of uh, put it into context, you know, with, in the unconventional medicine world, there are sort of biologically based approaches like diet and dietary supplements. And then there are the non-biologically based approaches, which include some of the physical methods we talked about, but then also other methods like relaxation methods. And I think often when people think about using something unconventional, they just think of biological methods like diet and dietary supplements. And biological approaches, they're done quite well by Western medicine. And I think a lot of the richness and uniqueness of unconventional medicine is often in those non-biological approaches. So of those non-biological approaches, I think one that really is kind of neglected by conventional medicine, neglected in the American cultures, just relaxation methods. You know, the body has different responses built into it, biological responses. So there's a fight or flight response. If you're mm -hmm. getting chased by an animal, you kind of get supercharged and may have extra strength. The reverse is called a rest and digest response or relaxation response. And that's something that American culture definitely does not cultivate. You know, we're kind of type A, hyperactive, just kind of moving all the time. It's good to be moving and producing and accomplishing. Uh, but much of the world actually uses the relaxation response and meditates on a daily basis or appreciates what it can do in the human body. And the body's programmed to do it. So there are various ways that that can be done. Uh, people often think of formal meditation or they start thinking about spirituality and then they think about going to Tibet for 10 years and they have to study under a monk, you know, have to get very involved and make it a spiritual thing. I think it's important to keep in mind that the core of it is biological and it's actually quite a simple biological response. You can add spirituality onto it if you want to, but the core relaxation response, that's quite easy to produce, doesn't require extensive meditation training. So there's very simple meditation techniques just involve simple breathing, closing the eyes, repeating a word when you exhale. Uh, and then there are more, somewhat more uh, involved methods with guided imagery, but same thing, those are very simple. You can lift, listen to a guided imagery tape once and you can feel the relaxation response. One of the things that comes to mind is, as you're talking to me right now about this is the word control. And as an MS patient, of course, you feel like you have none. And by embarking on some of these complementary alternatives, it's a way for you to assume a little bit of control and steer the rudder a bit for your, your course of trying to find a way to cope and maybe feel better. That's what an observation. Yeah, that's, I think you're right on, and I think that's a lot of the power of what I was saying, these non-biological, unconventional approaches. A lot of what they do is just tap into the healing that we already have within our body. And I think as Americans, if we feel something going on, that something doesn't feel right with our body, 
right away we think have to take a drug, have to have surgery. We kind of look outside our body, and that can be very uh, sort of take away your sense of control. If you know you have a relaxation process within, this, within you and you can turn it on whenever you want, that gives you a real sense of uh, empowerment, sort of mastery, and your body, even if you have, your brain, even if it has lesions in it, it still can produce this relaxation response? Well, I, I think in part it's about owning uh, this disease that you're dealing with, and it's not enough to say, I have this disease, I've gone to a doctor, I'm on a drug, uh, I'm the patient, you're the doctor, fix it. You know? Right. There really are quite a few options that people can consider using along with their conventional treatments. That's right. In fact, there are so many options, we couldn't fit them into one program. So join us for part two when Dr. Bowling and Rick Summers continue their discussion. But remember to talk to your physician about complementary or alternative approaches you might be considering. You want to be sure that these options are helpful and not harmful. See you next time.